good evening Community Faith Church. It's Wednesday night once again and today we are going to wrap up the book of Ephesians. This is our final session on the book of Ephesians and so tonight we're going to dig into a little bit about the armor of God and then about Paul's farewell as we dive right in. So if you've got your Bible you can open it up to Ephesians chapter 6 as we uh, move toward wrapping up. We're going to start in verse number 10. If you need a second to go get it well, you got a couple seconds as we uh, just kind of wind down and talk about where we've been. Uh, Paul started out this whole journey in the book of Ephesians, and he started with kind of giving us some insight spiritually about all that Christ has done, and, and um, talked about just uh, um, how Jesus has created this unification, how there's no more separation, uh, how uh, there's no Jew and Gentile anymore, that we're all in the same family, that we've been unified in Christ. Uh, and so he brought out some of this great revelation and understanding as to what has happened to us now and who we are as the body of Christ and how uh, the, the, um, uh, the hierarchy, if you will, has kind of been taken down and we're now in this unified body. And then he went into kind of a little bit more practical application of what that looked like and who we are as the church. And then he got into the equipping of the apostle, the prophet, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. And he talked about how those ministries were put in place by God um, as to the organizational structure of equipping the saints to do the very work of ministry as every joint supplies, everyone finds their connection, their knit. And they're knit in, and so it's no longer uh, a hierarchy type thing as much as it's an organism that works together. Um, and so the reality is, is you know, when we think about our own bodies, um, every poor part has value. Every part is important. Every part um, is necessary to the whole. And without it, we are very fractured. Um, and so, so it kind of, you know, that was, you know, Paul bringing us into that understanding. Um, and then he began to bring us into even more practicality as he took that into the next step into um, our own households, our own families. He spoke about husbands and wives and parents and children. Uh, and then he gave us some insight into um, the slaves and free. And, uh, you know, which again, depending on how you look at that today, the principles are the same. Um, so whether you look at that as uh, you know slave to to uh, uh, to, to servant um, or slave master if you will uh, master to servant or you can look at that as employer to employee um, uh, but however you you view that he was basically giving us some understanding that we're all in Christ and so even though we have differing roles in Christ uh, we there, there's not one that's superior over the other uh, and so that was the great challenge to us. And what a powerful challenge that is. Um, and so now um, Paul is kind of bringing us into this wrap up now. And uh, he starts off in verse number 10, finally. Now that word finally means, literally means for the rest. The Greek word there means for the rest. So that's interesting because Paul kind of said, okay, um, we're going to go through, uh, you know, husbands and wives, and then we're going to talk about kids and parents, and then we're going to talk about slaves um, and, uh, and masters. And, and then he says, and finally, or for the rest, if you will, um, and then he begins to talk about uh, the spiritual warfare. And really, I, I don't think that means that, you know, the, the, the parents and the husbands and wives are not included in this. That, that wouldn't be what it means at all. I think what he's saying is he's making a broader statement that really all of us now, um, and meaning everyone, uh, be strengthened in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Um, the strength of his power is, um, it's, it's kind of a it's, a, it's two words that ultimately mean might. Um, and so, uh, um, you know, again, depending on how you look at that, but basically what he's saying is to be strong in the might of God or um, in, in, in the, the idea is that it's God's power, uh, that it's not our strength or our might, but that we're uh, relying upon God's power, God's might, God's strength. He goes on to say in verse number 11, then clothe yourselves with the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So there's a couple things here because um, 
Paul is helping us, just as he just said, all the strength is God's strength. We don't want to rely on our natural strength. But then he says, we have a responsibility then to clothe with the full armor of God. That's something that we do. We put it on. It's our choice uh, to put it on and requires responsibility on our part. Um, but he goes on to say, so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. What are the schemes? Um, you know, what, I've used this illustration many times. It's kind of like think of Wile E. Coyote and the Roadrunner, right? Um, some versions actually say the wiles of the devil or the schemes of the devil. It's his plans to foil you. Uh, it is his traps that he sets. And it's not just... Um, you know, it's not necessarily Satan himself, but all of the demonic forces, all of that that's under his domain, which would also include the world. Um, it's, it's this uh, attitude or, or this uh, element of um, that, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's these, these schemes of the enemy. Now, thinking about this also, this whole book of Ephesians has been about unification of the body, the oneness of the body, uh, the union that we have in Christ and all of those things. Um, and that even from husbands and wives to children and parents to masters and slaves, we all have one master, one, one God, uh, and that we're all one in him. And so uh, one of the things that, that Satan is always attacking is that unification trying to bring disunity, trying to build hierarchies, trying to um, uh, get people to feel like they need to rise up or push against the unity of God. Um, and so these are some of the schemes of the devil when you kind of consider it in light of the fullness of the book. Um, I don't think Paul is just shifting gears here and going off on a tangent. He's been on a very consistent theme throughout this whole book. Um, and so he says, close yourself with that full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. He goes on, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world rulers of the darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. Now, um, here's a reality check for us all. Uh, verse number 12 starts right, starts right out, for our struggle. Uh, if we want to obey God, if we want to resist the devil and stand with God, you're going to be in for a struggle. We are, uh, we live in a fallen world. Uh, we still are connected to a fallen body that is eventually going to pass away. Uh, we have a new body coming that isn't going to be bent towards sin, uh, but we have tendencies and things, sinful nature. Um, our sinful nature has been replaced, but our sinful tendencies our mindsets, all those things um, that we fight to renew, it's a struggle, it's a battle, and we're always in this struggle. Um, and we're in the struggle against the rulers, against the powers, the world rulers of this darkness, um, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenlies. What Paul is saying is, this isn't a natural battle. It's a spiritual battle. Um, now some people may, and there are some commentators out there that look at this as, uh, different spheres like we have rulers we have powers we have world rulers and we have spiritual forces of evil um, I don't think that they are definitely or, or that they are um, kind of definitive different kinds of adversaries as much as they point to different characteristics of all of our adversaries if you will um, rulers it kind of stresses their authority uh, powers um, or, or authorities, spirit, um, uh, you know, again, Nat uses powers. Um, I, I think that has more to do with their strength, that, that they are, um, again, they have power. They are powerful. Uh, don't think of your enemy as totally weak. Um, he has an entire world mesmerized. Uh, I, I would say he has a, a fair amount of power um, and, uh, again, a fair amount of control, of authority. Um, and it's given, granted, people have willingly submitted it, um, but they've willingly submitted it through deception, uh, not because they, they willfully understood what they were doing. Um, but he goes on to say, uh, you know, against spiritual forces, actually he says world rulers, uh, world rulers, some verses say world, world forces of this darkness, um, powers of this dark world, uh, you know, however, you know, whatever the version that you're looking at says, um, but it basically talks about their, 
um, their kind of influence over the world, the, the, um, uh, the broad influence, if you will, over the world, a very, a very broad um, and, uh, and world rulership. Uh, just like any ruler in the natural doesn't necessarily come into your house and dictate to you everything, but they rule through um, a form of acceptance in the community, whether that be by fear or um, through reward or whatever that looks like. Um, but, but that's how rulership happens. Um, you can look at just even how people have complied with certain rules that the government has done right now with the whole COVID-19. Um, you know, we have, we're, we're wearing masks, we're social distancing, all these types of things, because um, the, the influential people People have told us that those are things to do uh, to mitigate uh, and and to um, I guess to, to battle against uh, this particular disease and so what happens is as those things become sociably acceptable uh, then you find within the social structure there are people who will uh, just through press through the peer pressure of the day uh, challenge those who are who fight against that standard um, or for, fight against that status quo. It's the same thing that happens with spiritual wickedness. The devil gets things to become acceptable. Things like you know, I mean, I mean, we can just look in our own culture. Uh, things like homosexuality, uh, you know, transgenderism, those types of things. When it comes to human sexuality, God has a plan for that. Um, the acceptance of divorce. The uh, the acceptance of the destruction of the marriage of the household, um, you know, uh, single parenting, some of these types of things. None of these were God's plan. Uh, you know, God has a way to navigate those waters, but that was not the plan of God. The plan of God was, uh, like we just read in earlier in Ephesians, uh, for strong marriages, strong families, strong children, to build strong cultures, strong communities. I mean, that's, that's the plan. That's the way God set it up. But you have the spiritual wickedness of the day, these rulers of the, of the world, um, world rulers, spiritual rulers, that are bringing bring influential uh, to the community, and then they bring with them a level of peer pressure that causes the rest of the community then to follow suit out of fear or out of uh, shame or, uh, you know, whatever, however, however the enemy rules, or by pleasure even. Um, there'll be lots of ways that the enemy will rule in that. Uh, so you could even look at the um, the objectification of uh, of the, of women. Um, you know, there, there's there's just lots of different things in our culture that it's easy to point to that they're anti-scriptural and they're driven uh, by a demonic worldly view. Uh, so moving on, um, he says. Uh, world rulers um, of this darkness, and then against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. So these spiritual forces of evil uh, ultimately is talking about um, their, uh, um, just the evil character, the, the, um, the evil intent um, that, uh, you know, kind of that, that realm of, of, can, you know that the, they they have a dwelling and and they're they have a strategy, if you will, um, an influential way uh, to. But their their goal, their motives, um, their their motivation is evil and to spread evil. Uh, so he goes on to say, verse thirteen: For this reason, take up the full armor of God, so that you may be able to stand your ground. So you're going to be constantly under pressure from the evil world and the worldly system and the systems controlled by, uh, by evil, that all of these things are always going to be getting, trying to push you um, and to keep you from holding your ground um, and holding your standard. Uh, so um, for this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand your ground on the evil day. Um, evil day there. I don't, I don't think that, I personally don't think that's talking about a day in the future or that Paul was talking about a day in the future. I think he's talking about in the fact that we live in the day of evil, that evil is 
uh, the ruling authority until Christ comes and completely annihilates that? Um, and is there truly the ruler over all things? Until that day comes, you and I are kind of stuck with this uh, evil world that we live in, and I believe that's the evil day he's talking about. Then he goes on to say, having done everything to stand, stand firm, therefore, by fastening the belt of truth around your waist, um, and by putting on the breastplate of righteousness. So let's start with the, um, the belt of truth. I think with each of these, you'll see that there is kind of two sides to the coin. Um, I believe that he's talking about the, in the belt of truth here. Basically what Paul is doing is he's taking an image that everyone knows, which is the Roman soldier. I mean, everyone in this day, Roman soldiers were everywhere. They were like policemen. They were everywhere. Uh, they were very, you know, uh, very visible Everyone understood them. Everybody knew what their garb was. Everyone knew uh, their uniform uh, and, and understood that. So as Paul was talking about it, uh, it, was, it was a way to just kind of take a natural item in life that everyone understood and connect that now to some spiritual principles. And uh, he talks about, you know, it basically talks this through like kind of in the order that a Roman soldier would put these things on. Uh, and so the belt of truth around your waist. Um, now, when we talk about truth, truth can refer both to God's truth, uh, the revealed truth of God uh, that, you know, as a Christian, we're believers of. Um, but it also could be about the, our own character of being truthful, um, our own, excuse me, our own integrity, uh, speaking the truth, uh, being those who are bearers of truth. Um, and our own personal truthfulness, uh, basically a lifestyle that reflects truth. Um, and then he goes on to say, by putting on the breastplate of righteousness. Um, so righteousness, I think, again, looks at the same things. It is Christ's righteousness that we bear, putting on his righteousness, but also our own righteous conduct. Um, that both of these things, I believe, are in view. That Paul is, um, as, he, as he lays this out, because he says it's our job to put it on, um, which has to do with the renewing of our mind and what we believe, as well as then we're acting upon what we believe. Uh, and so I think it's a combination of what God has done, as well as our behavior. Um, he goes on to say in verse number 15, by fitting your feet with the preparation that comes from the, God, uh, from the good news of peace. Um, so the, the Roman infantrymen would have these sandals that, that uh, they would have, um, they were like spiked uh, at the, on the bottoms. Um, they, were, uh, they were like a hard leather uh, base that had um, like nails through them. Um, not super deep, but long enough that they would, uh, you know, almost like cleats or, or something like an athlete would use. Uh, and it was, they were, you know, specific uh, to increase their traction, to give them um, good traction and be able to stand their ground when they're pushed against or, uh, you know, um, even the way that they would fight, they would get in lines, you know, kind of, we'll talk a little bit more about that with their shields, but um, uh, they would get in lines and, 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 you know, there would be pressure coming from the onslaught of the enemy and it was a way for them to hold their ground, grip in, dig in, and continue to push forward. Uh, and so it's that preparation that comes from the good news of peace. The gospel of peace uh, most likely here is referring to the, the, uh, the, you know, that what we believe that enables us to stand our ground. And, and when we talk about the gospel, Paul uses the term gospel often. He's talking about the full package of Christ's finished work, the, the, um, the, the, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the taking on of sin, the atonement for sin, um, all of that, that whole package, the reconciliation to God, the regeneration of our heart, that, that whole package of gospel, um, that it is, that is our peace, that we now have peace with God. Um, and so I believe that's what he's talking about here because that's just been a consistent theme of Paul uh, in all of his writings. So looking at verse number 16, then he says, And in all of this, by taking up the shield of faith, 
which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Um, now again, it's a, it's a picture that everyone would understand because the Roman soldier's shield um, was actually quite large. It was quite tall. Uh, it, was, it was supposed to cover um, basically from about their chin all the way down to, uh, to, their, to their shins, um, that, that they would hold that up. And, um, uh, and then it, they would, the front of it was covered with leather. And before they would go to battle, they would actually uh, moisten, put those in water, soak them in water, uh, so that the, the wet leather would extinguish the arrows that uh, were being flared from, from the enemy. And often what would happen is they would put themselves in lines. So the shield was large enough that it would cover the width of the soldier as well as its height if he crouched down. And basically what they would do is they would stand in a great line and they would put all their shields up. And then those that were behind them would raise their shields up over their heads. And essentially they were like a big moving, you know, kind of wooden leather, uh, uh, almost like a vehicle. And they could continue to move forward. And as the enemy would penetrate with darts and, and arrows and things like that, they would hit the shields and, and the, the men would be able to continue to move forward. Uh, so you understand that's the picture that Paul's trying to say. And he's saying that it is this, um, this shield of faith uh, that we have, that is um, uh, that is our our uh, our our way of that flame retardant against the enemy's attack on us. It is that trust that in all God, uh, God uh, we can trust in our God. He is he. We can trust in what he said. We can stand and believe. Um, that's what faith is. Faith is taking God at his word. It is trusting him um, in all that he has revealed, everything that he has uh, revealed to us that we can trust it um, and that we end in the moment of spiritual attack, even though symptoms or other things may be coming against us that are trying to tell us otherwise, we can trust in that word of God and hold up that shield of faith to, to extinguish the lies of the enemy. Um, and those, those darts there, those, those uh, lying things that are coming at us, trying to tell us something different than what God has said. Uh, and so that's what that shield of faith is, extinguishing the flaming arrows of the evil one. Verse number 17, and take the helmet of salvation uh, and the sword of the spirit. So let's talk about the helmet first. Um, so we as Christians were to, were to put on um, our salvation and uh, this helmet of salvation is I believe that when, when he's talking about this realm of salvation it's about deliverance um, it's the recognition of deliverance from sin that I've been delivered from my past that I've been delivered from all that has brought me to curse and now it is also about my deliverance in my current situation, that um, my God is my salvation. He's my savior. He will deliver me and save me out of my calamity. Um, that, uh, that, that, uh, you know, and that is what protects my mind from doubt and wonder and, you know, will God come through? But it's that trusting in him um, that my God is my deliverer and that he will set me free. Um, and so uh, even, you know, when I'm under this attack from Satan, I can trust in my Savior to save me. Uh, and I, I really believe that that's what Paul's getting at here. Um, and then he goes on to talk about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Um, the sword of the Spirit is uh, the word uh, for the Word of God here. The, the word word there is actually the word rhema. Um, which is, you know, you, you probably have heard those two terms before, rhema and logos. Logos meaning the written word, rhema meaning the spoken word. Um, and I believe that Paul is saying that sword of the spirit is us activating and engaging the word of God. Um, it goes to, you know, what the Bible says, the power of life and death are in the tongue. Those that love it will eat its fruit, right? We're, we're affecting our future and we're, and we're making a difference in the present with the words that come out of our mouth. And our words need to line up with God's word that we need to basically attack with the rhema, with the word of God for the season in our particular 
particular situation um, and declare that word. Just like Jesus did in the, in the, um, uh, when he was in the desert and Satan was trying to tempt him. And he says, you know, but, you know, but the word of the Lord is, you know, man shall not live on bread alone, that kind of thing. Uh, and so it was that word in season that shut down the attack of the enemy um, and the temptation of the enemy. Uh, so, so um, that that appropriate scripture at the appropriate time um, is a powerful weapon in our hand. Uh, so now we move toward, um, I, and I believe that Paul kind of even addresses this. I, I think he's talking about the use of the uh, the sword of the spirit. As we get into verse eighteen, he says, "With every prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit, and to this end, be alert." Um, with all perseverance requests for the saints. So let's let's break this down a little bit. With every prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. So I believe, again, he's attaching that to the sword of the Spirit. It's that rhema prayer life. It's that praying through the will of God, the plan of God, um, calling forth and declaring the things that God has said. Um, and he goes on, you know, with every prayer and petition at all times um, in the Spirit. Uh, prayers and petitions, prayers are kind of that general communication, that communal system that we're in conversation with God. Petitions, though, are getting more direct, talking about specific items, specific things. Um, he goes on, you know, praying at all times in the spirit. In other words, um, that this isn't from our carnality or from our own desires, uh, but that we're praying in the spirit. We're praying forth the plan and the will of God over our lives and over the lives of others, as you'll see in a second. Um, that he, it, Paul is challenging us to take that beyond our own personal view because um, he says, and to this end, be alert with all perseverance and requests for all the saints. So again, I think Paul never loses sight of the whole purpose of this book, the unification of the body, how we are all one and how we now pray for one another and we stand with one another and we bear with one another and we are in union with one another. And, and so it's necessary that we pray at all times in the spirit and to this end, be alert, recognize where the enemy is trying to attack and break down the body with all perseverance and requests for all the saints, that that unification would be strong and that we would be walking in the fullness of what God has for us and what God has called us to do, as well as the example that God has called us to be. Uh, that, that's the heart of what Paul's saying and recognizing that it's not reliant just on us, nor is it reliant just on God, but it's something synergistically that we work together. God uses us to manifest and to bring forth these things as we pray them through. Um, so uh, he goes on in verse 19, Pray for me also that I may be given the message when I begin to speak, that I may confidently make known the mystery of the gospel, uh, for which I am an ambassador in chain. Uh, pray that I may be able to speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now, in this case, Paul is, is talking about the reality that he is in chains and he is on his way to make his appeal to Caesar. That, that, that is his mega moment is coming. And he's saying, pray for me that I might be given the message when I begin to speak, that when I have my day in court, if you will, um, that God will give me the words to say um, and that I am confident or that I make may confidently make known the mystery of the gospel, that God would give me insight and wisdom in a way to be able to present the gospel of which he is in chains for, uh, for which I am an ambassador in chains, he says. Uh, pray that I'm able to speak boldly uh, as I ought to speak, which I think the boldness reference there um, is, uh, you know, just that, that uh, he would have the courage, uh, that he would not be uh, intimidated by the audience uh, that he's in. Uh, and so that brings us to the final wrap-up here in verse number 21. Uh, he says, Tychius, my brother, dear, uh, my dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will make everything known to you so that you too may know about my circumstances, how I am doing. Verse 22, I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that uh, you may know our circumstances and that he may encourage you your heart. Uh, so Paul is just giving explanation um, to Tychius, who, uh, you know, literally his name is Chance, um, uh, but uh, he's the one that's bringing the letter. Uh, he's coming from Paul. He's carrying it on purpose, um, and uh, he, is, he is there to 
not only deliver the letter, but also uh, give them, uh, fill them in on what's been happening and how everything's going, um, and to encourage their hearts, to encourage them, uh, and uh, and to you know to encourage their hearts in what God is doing, what Paul is doing, uh, that this is all part of the plan of God, um, and so. Uh, it's almost identical to the way Paul wrote in uh, Colossians 4. Um, so Tychius is on a mission, and this is his mission to receive him that way, is ultimately what Paul's saying. Verse number 23, Peace to the brothers and sisters, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that might just sound like a nice way to end, but I think there's more at stake here. He, um, uh, Paul, I, again, he's never lost sight of the, the fullness of what this... He, he's not chasing a rabbit here. He didn't change gears in the book of Ephesians. He's been on a consistent message about how Christ has unified us as the body um, and as his body and, and uh, removed kind of all of the segregation among us and brought us together as one. That, that really is kind of the central theme of the book of Ephesians. Um, and, uh, and so now in verse 23, he's saying, Peace to the brothers and sisters. Peace was necessary because of this Jew-Gentile problem. This was a major issue that Paul was addressing. And he's saying, peace to the brothers and sisters. Peace to um, this whole element of separation between Jew and Gentile. This whole element of male and female. And that everyone would, would embrace the role that they have and recognize that their role is unto Christ. Uh, and to serve and to minister that way that there would be peace in the unification of God's body. And love with faith uh, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so uh, again, love is the key to peace. Um, you know, and when, and when faith, um, you know, love with faith, meaning that it's uh, directed, we walk in love because we know the truth. And we live out and, and by faith that truth that we know. Um, you know, that came from God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, verse number 24, he wraps this up and ends it the way he started it. Uh, you know, we, we saw in the very beginning in chapter 1, verse 2, uh, Paul said, grace to you, and now he's in verse 24, wrapping up, uh, bookending, if you will, his letter with grace be with you all. Um, and so verse 24, grace be with all for those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Um, and so again, Paul is ending his book uh, the way that he started it, that all of this is, um, is the gift of God, and we have the privilege of operating, living, and being a part of this body of Christ. Not to make it our way, not to, not to conform the body of Christ to our way, but for us to conform to Christ's image and his way. And we have the privilege to do that. None of us are forced to, but all of us are called to. And uh, may the grace of God give us the grace, the strength, and the willingness to accomplish what God has called us to, rather than fighting or struggling against it or trying to hold on to our own way. Instead, may we embrace who we are in Christ, embrace our specific role, our purpose, and our place, and enjoy serving the Lord as unto him in that place and role that God has put us in. So amen. God bless you. Uh, thanks for, for hanging out with me today. I pray this word has encouraged you. I pray this book has encouraged you. And uh, we'll talk about what we're going to do next as we move on in these Wednesdays. Uh, we're going to do a few more weeks of this, and then we're going to get back to uh, live services and bringing in uh, those that uh, have been being brought up to start preaching the gospel as well. And so looking forward to reinstating uh, those nights as well. So God bless you. Call you blessed. And I will see you on Sunday morning. Actually, Saturday is our church picnic if you're coming out at Valhalla Park. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you Sunday. But bless you. Love you.